I'm not going to lie to you guys. <laughs> I'm terrified. Um, <laughs> they put a PhD on the end of my name just to make me feel better. I'm actually the only non-PhD in the group, and I've spent very, 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 very little time with the Dalai Lama. <laughs> We've, <laughs> thanks. We've, uh, we've heard about some very exciting things today. Uh, uh, romance and war and, and, and sex and David Eagleman took his clothes off. Just getting started. But uh, we saved the best for last, data. <laughs> I, wanna, I wanna talk about the human experience of data. What does it feel like today to be in this big data world? I, I do a lot of traveling. Um, I actually just came in yesterday from Hong Kong. And, and the, the world of air travel is a really interesting one. Um, because I think it's a good metaphor to think about what this big data experience is starting to be like. First of all, because we're immersed in a system that is so complex that we can hardly understand it. We catch little glimpses of it as your baggage goes through those little baggage sorting doors and, and as those uh, men in strange suits come to fuel the plane but we really only see a very small window on that experience. The entirety of the experience is too hard to comprehend. At any given time, there are more than a million people in the air. And what you're seeing right now is a visualization of all of those flights landing and taking off on 15 minute intervals. It's sped up a little bit to give you this kind of respiring system, this, this incredibly complex system of of air travel. And more than anything, it's a, it's, a, it's a system in which we lose control. It's maybe the only place in our lives where, I vo where we voluntarily give up control. So I think this, this incredible complexity and this lack of control are very important in our thinking about what is the human experience of data. The American novelist David Foster Wallace, when he was writing um, Infinite Jest, this gigantic phone book of a book that has um, footnotes in it and footnotes of footnotes and occasionally footnotes of footnotes of footnotes, he said that one of the things that he wanted to do was mimic the information flood and data triage that he expected to be a bigger part of US life, 15 years from when it was written, which was 16 years ago. And, and so let's, let's just talk a little bit about what data is. What is the stuff that's flooding us? Well, we can define data as measurements of something. And another useful sort of alternative to that is we can think of them as records of something. And we're creating more measurements and more records. That's the, that's the main thing that's happening with this big data world. And I, I run this company called Office Creative for Creative Research, and we're focused on one side of this data picture. And to help you understand what that side is, let me just go back in history uh, a little bit to a couple of famous visualizations. This is Florence Nightingale's um, rose diagram about the people who were being killed in the Crimean War. Here she was trying to say um, that more people are dying from disease than by far than who were getting killed in the war itself. So this is taking a very complicated system and it's reducing it to something that's simple and easy to view. At the same time, um, Snow published this, this uh, uh, map of cholera instances in London. And the difference, I think, here between the graphic we just saw and this one is this was revealing something that had never been seen before. So I think about this difference between um, reduction and revelation also at around the same time using medical technology. So this is the blood pressure uh, meter, the sphygma monometer, and, and it takes a very complicated thing and makes it simple. And then this is the x-ray. It shows us something that we've never seen before. We can do the same things with data. We can reduce or we can reveal. And the things that I'm most obsessed with are these uh, times when we can reveal. So um, this is, these are some tweets that I just pulled from Twitter to give you an example for the next project I'm going to show you. These are randomly pulled tweets of people who use the phrase just landed to give you a character of what those types of tweets look like. Um, four years ago, I built this project where I took, a whole, I took 36 hours of people saying just landed. And because I know where they're going, they just told me. And because uh, I know where they live, because they also told me. I can, I can plot a, a small uh, slice of world travel, you know, rich white Twitter users. Um, <laughs> But, but it's, an interesting, uh, it's an interesting model. And, and then this companion project is Good Morning. This is everybody in 2009 saying good morning on Twitter. The people in green are people who wake up and say good morning early. The people in uh, red are people who say good morning a little bit later. You know, the point here is that we're seeing something we could have never seen before. Right? It's a, this emergent visual system. That, and these types of systems are the ones that really excite me. 
Uh, I spent two and a half years at the New York Times as the data artist in residence, a title that, yes, I did make up. And I worked there with a guy named Mark Hansen, and, and he ended up being a co-founder of my company. And, and, and we worked on a project called Cascade there. And what Cascade did is it looked at every piece of content that the New York Times created, and it allowed us to visualize conversations around that content. So here's a quick example. This is a, a story called The Island Where People Forgot to Die. And what we're seeing here is we're seeing this tree of conversation that grows from one single tweet. So one single person said something about this story, and then everybody else, all those pink dots that we're seeing, those other people reading the story. And I can not only see this view of, of the data, but I can switch into another view, which doesn't just show me the profile, but shows me the kind of separate threads of conversation that are coming out of it. And I'll tell you what the most exciting thing about this project was, is that when we were talking about conversation before we visualized, we had very limited terms to use to describe these conversations. We could be like a good conversation, a, a long conversation, a short conversation. But by building these cascade structures, which is what we call them, we were able to add our, to our language. We were able to say, oh, this is a tall conversation. Uh, the one before a bushy conversation. And this is a kind of offset or an uh, uh, unbalanced conversation. So one of the things that visualization allows us to do is it allows us to add to our vocabulary of thought. We can think about things differently by being able to build more visual constructs around them. And I think that's a really important thing that's going to advance our engagement with all of these big data systems. Um, Getting back to Revelation, though, Revelation is not only about big systems, it's about smaller ones as well. Uh, a, a couple of years ago now, it was, it was um, revealed that your iPhone was uh, storing your location data unsecurely. And we, so uh, everyone was up in arms about this. Uh, at the Times R&D Lab, we were like, yes, the world's largest location database. It's unsecure. We can get people to give it to us um, or to give it to researchers who can use that data for good. So we built this tool called Open Paths. You can uh, still find it at openpaths.cc. If you have an Android or an iPhone device, you can use it. You can upload your data. You can keep it securely, and you can sort of visualize these patterns of your life as you go and, and view your life. So for us, it was, it was a couple of things. It was an exercise in this idea of data ownership, which I think is, again, going to be really important when we talk about the future of data and humans. How can we own this stuff instead of Facebook and Google and all these gigantic evil corporations? And, um, and, and, and because we see this all the time, we're getting requests for permission to use our data, but we never get to use it ourselves. We never actually get to use that data ourselves. So again, it was an experiment in this thing which we call first party access. But more than that, for me, um, I started working with my data. Um, Brian House, who was, who was one of the re uh, researchers with me, also started working with their data. And we were excited in this thing. This is a... Um, a note from the California District Attorney's Handbook, and it says, cellular phones have become the virtual biography of our da daily activities, which is totally true. And so you, by looking at our data, we can see pieces of this data, and we can see our life in ways that we didn't understand. These are the m meaningful locations in New York City for Brian, and these are some more abstract uh, images that I made from my open path data showing the directional vectors that I took during a day. It kind of reads like a clock on its side. And, and I have this really, uh, it's a kind of weird thing here, so stick with me. I have this idea that people could put these things up in their bedroom, right? And then before they go to bed, they could look at it and they could say, good night, data. <laughs> and, and the reason why I want that is because I want people to build a, a personal relationship with their data. These are... Um, these are three of my location points. So there's one, there's another one, uh, there's another one. These are just numbers, right? We can discard these things pretty easily. Uh, the first one was um, the moment I stepped off the plane in New York. I spent 27 years in Vancouver. I've been in New York for three years. Maybe the most changing moment of my life. The second one was this Thai meal that I had on Amsterdam Avenue. I had it with this glass of Riesling. And, and I wouldn't have remembered that moment at all if it weren't for my data. And the third one that I showed you, that was the moment I, I met my girlfriend. So I, I would love to show my grandchildren this thing. <laughs> and, and be like that, that's why. That's why you are here, is uh, this thing. Um, and, and, and I, I think that these some things can, can become even more interesting 
and, and more in some ways abstract than that if we back up a little bit because more and more things are becoming data. There's this beautiful transition when something becomes data, when it becomes measured and recorded because we can do more with it. And, and those, things, those more things can be good, they can be bad, but they're almost always um, interesting. This is Ben Rubin, he's my other business partner and for years he was working on a project at the um, public theater in New York called the Shakespeare Machine. Because one of the exciting things that's happened with Shakespeare is Shakespeare has become data. There's this project called the Monk Project where they've gone through all of Shakespeare and they've cataloged the language into files like this, um, powered by grad students, and, and, uh, and now we can look at all of Shakespeare. And remember when you were in high school and you broke sentences into those kind of sentence trees? Well, we can do the same thing with Shakespeare, but the, we have all of these possible um, uh, forms of speech in there. And so we can play these games. So a really easy game to say is, I want to look at adjective, uh, or sorry, um, article, adjective, noun. And article, adjective, noun gives us a list of phrases, which that's this really simple game to play with text, but it's actually pretty beautiful with Shakespeare. This is a, a, a small peek of uh, those article, adjective, noun um, combinations in, in Shakespeare. And, and so because this stuff became data, we can do things with it which just open our doors and opportunity to the way that we understand and experience this thing that's hundreds and hundreds of years old. So in some ways here, um, oh, here's, a, here's a, a video of Shakespeare Machine. If you're ever in New York in the public theater, it's a permanent installation. There's 37 blades, one for each play of the, of the um, theatrical works of Shakespeare. And the content on, on each individual blade is from that play only. So just pick one in your head. That one's Hamlet. It's not, but just pretend it is. And, and, and you'll, you can see that all the text that arrives on that blade is Hamlet. And by playing these games across the plays, then we can understand Shakespeare in a way that we didn't understand it before. Um, I'm going to skip the second video. So here we're, we're kind of dealing with history as, as data, but I think a really important thing that we have to understand as humans is the opposite. Data is history. And when the dust settles on the 21st century, our most important cultural artifacts are not going to be plays, they're not going to be books, they're not going to be movies, they will be databases. What will we do with these databases? I don't know, but I don't think what we'll do is just open them up and read them, that will be boring. So we've been thinking about ways that we can perform these databases. This is a project we did at the eBay headquarters last year. Um, and the project is called Before Us Stands the Salesman's House because we built it always to start with death of a salesman. I have no idea how they let us do this, by the way. Um, and what we do is we start with a book, so death of a salesman, and we look at the text of that book. And, and what we're looking for here is we're looking for things that could be sold on eBay. So we use an algorithm to extract all the things that could be sold on eBay. We then look at each of those items and see who is selling them, for how much money, what kind of descriptions are they using, where are these sales happening. We dive into the micro stories of these objects, and then we, we do this as a circular game. We, we end up in a location that sold a flute, and then we find out what books are people reading in that location that sold a flute. We use one of those books as the seed for the next round of this game. Um, you can see a video of this online, um, and hopefully we'll get a chance to install it and some pieces of that, that puzzle. So we look at this immense thing, but we use some algorithmic games to try to walk through it and invent some type of experience of it that is not just the database. What is it like to have these databases be played back to you? Because information has certainly changed in scale. It's changed in scale so much that we can't read things anymore. Or I should say we can't do a close reading of things. So to steal a phrase from Franco Moretti, what we can do is we can do a distant reading. We can use computers to allow us to look at these things from a very far distance. Very much like when you're in an airplane. The ground, you can't see detail anymore. I can't see people's faces. I can't read the signs on streets. I can't, I can't look at, at, at the license plates of cars. But what I do see is I see pattern which was otherwise unachievable. Right? And so by using computation, we can do distant readings of, um, of, of data sets. And I love this quote by Franco Moretti, to understand literature, we must stop reading books. Um, this is a map of every hotel in the world. Uh, and and this, is, this is the kind of way which I think we're tempted to represent a data set like this. Uh, we can do some games with it, color it by the star rating and so on and so on. But what these types of visualizations ignore is that a hotel is a human experience. 
I know this only too much lately traveling. A hotel is a bizarre, a bizarre place. So um, we just finished a project up in Vancouver where we decided to do something similar to the last project I showed you where we um, used a series of famous novels. We start with this with, um, with actually we start with Lolita, not on the road, but we can use one of these novels and we say, what hotels would the people stay in if they were traveling today, the characters in those novels? And we use that as a mechanism to dig through this. Uh, the piece is called The Room Would Be Good Enough for the Time She Had to Stay. And I'll show you some pictures of it. I just realized that the last thing I was supposed to add late last night was a video of the piece. So you'll have to um, go to our website and see a video of the piece. But what you, what you see is you see all of these characters from these um, literary pieces traveling through this landscape. And then you see in live, in real time, you see images that people have posted from those hotels, reviews from those hotels, prices of those hotels. So in a way, we manage this massive landscape by breaking it down into, into narratives which, which are, are meaningful um, to us. So, uh, I, you know, this is the reason why I talk about this stuff, because I hate this so much for a couple of reasons. First of all, really, like, we f***ed up oil so badly, we, and now we're trying to say the data is the new one? But more than that, data is not just a resource, right? It's, it's a substrate that we can be creative on. It's a surface which allows us to reflect. It allows us to see things in ways that we have never seen them before. And I don't think we understand this yet at all. So I'm trying to just get some things into your head. And I'm going to use my last 30 seconds to read a quote by Thomas Pynchon. Um, she looked down a slope, needing to squint for the sunlight onto a vast sprawl of houses which had grown up all together, like a well-tended crop from the dull brown earth. And she had thought at the time she'd opened a transistor radio to replace a battery and seen her first printed circuit. The ordered swirl of houses and streets from this high angle, they sprang at her now with the same unexpected, astonishing clarity as the circuit card had. Though she knew even less about the radios than she knew about Southern Californians, there were to both outward patterns a hieroglyphic sense of concealed meaning, of an intent to communicate. There seemed no limit to what the printed circuit could have told her if she had tried to find out. So in her first minute of San Narciso, a revelation also trembled just past the threshold of her understanding. Thank you. <laughs>